Here's your word for the day from Calvary in Lake Havasu. Visit us on the web at calvaryaz.com. Well, hello there. I'm Pastor Sean. Welcome back to our introduction of Jephthah from Judges 10 and 11. If you missed yesterday, we talked about how Jephthah's rocky past didn't have a say in the purpose and plan that God had for him to lead the Israelites out of trouble. And Jephthah trusted God and said yes to the mission, even amidst past hurts, skepticism, and whatever else. Today, we're going to take a quick look at Jephthah's leadership. Him saying yes to the mission was only the beginning of God working through his life. But now his duty was to stay faithful to God in his leadership, something all of us can learn from. Jephthah's leadership required him to, one, stand up for truth, even in opposition, and two, he had to follow through on promises, even when it required immense sacrifice. The first thing that Jephthah did in his leadership was what most leaders hate to do. He had to communicate with a hostile party. And this wasn't some email chain with, with a, a spiteful coworker. No, Jephthah had to send out a message to the leader of the Ammonite army, the opposing force wanting to destroy them. Well, in that communication, the Ammonite king questioned the legitimacy of Israel's ownership of the land the Israelites were in. And he demanded that they give the land to the Ammonite army. Jephthah probably could have lied or appeased the Ammonite king, but instead he stated truth, even though that truth meant war. Jephthah stood for what was true, not because it meant they would keep their land, but because the truth was the land was given to them by the Lord God Almighty. Jephthah explains this in, in Judges eleven twenty one through 23, where he says this, Then the Lord, the God of Israel, gave Sihon and his whole army into Israel's hands, and they defeated them. Israel took over all the land of the Amorites who lived in that country, capturing all of it from the Arnon to the Jabbok, from the desert to the Jordan. Now, since the Lord God of Israel has driven out the Amorites before his people Israel, what right have you to take it over? Very pointed, but the truth that surrounds the people of God is worth standing up for. And the truth that we carry all is all the same that Jesus died on a cross to remove sins and save anyone who believes in him and professes him as their king. It doesn't, doesn't always mean that we go to war for this truth, but sometimes we as Christians shy away from that full truth. Maybe because sometimes we're scared, or maybe we think we're being kind or loving, or maybe we question it ourselves. But the truth that Jesus is king and is, and is worthy to save is more than worth, worth standing up for. So do it in love but do it because the truth that we carry about God can very well change the world. Now, after Jephthah communicated and stood up for the truth, the Ammonite king ignored his message. Speaking truth doesn't always mean everyone's going to be on our side, but it really doesn't matter. The world and those who abide by the world are wasting away and often unable to even hear or care about the gospel truth that we have. And so Jephthah readied himself for war. The second thing that stands out about Jephthah is that he was true to his word and promises to the Lord. And I'm curious, have you ever made a promise to God? Lord, get me through this, or get me this, and I'll go to church every Sunday, or I'll tithe more, or I'll read my Bible, or I'll be kinder to this person, whatever it is. I'm sure some of us have a hard time keeping even those simple promises to God. But Check this out, Jephthah, on his way to attack the Ammonites, made a pretty terrible promise to the Lord if he would give them to him. Check this out in Judges 11, 30 through 34. It says this, And Jephthah made a vow to the Lord, If you give the Ammonites into my hands, whatever comes out of the door of my house to meet me when I return in triumph from the Ammonites will be the Lord's, and I will sacrifice it as a burnt offering. Then... This is further in the story. Jephthah went over to fight the Ammonites, and the Lord did give them into his hands. He devastated 20 towns from Aror to the vicinity of Mineth, as far as Abel Kermim. Thus Israel subdued Ammon. When Jephthah returned to his home in Mizpah, who should come out to meet him but his daughter, dancing to the sound of timbrels? And the thing that stinks is that she was his only child, except for her. He had no other son or daughter. You know, I wonder if he even needed to make that promise to the Lord in the first place. But it really doesn't matter. Because as tragic as it is, 
He did give his daughter to the Lord as a burnt offering, just like he vowed he would. Now, if you didn't know, you you can zoom on over to Leviticus to figure out that a burnt offering is true to what it sounds like. The offering in question is burnt to a crisp from day to night. However, some scholars think that because the chapter focuses so much on her being a virgin and not being able to marry, that, that he may not have actually killed her, but instead kept her from ever marrying or having children. And as someone who has a a little daughter, uh, both of those options are pretty terrible. But either way, either way, his faithfulness to the Lord, his faithfulness to keep promises was admirable. And it required sacrifice and follow through. Look, you'll, you'll never find yourself, at least I hope not, having to make the decision that Jephthah did with his daughter. But following God in faithfulness today also requires sacrifice. Flip on over to Romans 12 with me real quick. Let's read what that sacrifice calls us to today. Romans 12 verse 1 says this, Therefore I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true and proper worship. Honestly, this is way better option than than sacrificing your daughter, but, but what I'm worried about, is that we have a lot of people who say they follow Christ and yet have no sacrifice in their life. Instead of living for Jesus, they still live for themselves or their values or their goals. They still live that same sinful life. They just slap Christian on the outside and call it a day. Look, I'm not just pointing a finger. I suffer from it too. I think a lot of us do. And so let this be a reminder. Let this be a reminder. We made a vow to God just like Jephthah did. But instead, we declare Christ is the king of our lives, which means this, we are a living sacrifice. And what that means is that we belong on the altar of the burnt offering and not the throne of our lives. Sometimes this living sacrifice tries to crawl its way back onto that throne, beaten and bloody. But thankfully, we have the most loving and gracious God. And Jesus gently reminds us that That's his seat. It's not ours. And our bodies, being a living sacrifice, require constant follow-through, even when it's hard. Because it's hard to confess a sin that we've been hiding for so long. It's hard to repent from the anger that's protected you most of your life. It's hard to stop idolizing money or your toys. But this is what it means to follow Christ, to live as a sacrifice for God. So Jephthah, was a successful judge. Although he made a weird promise to the Lord, he won against those Ammonites. And his ability to give glory to God, stay stay true to his word, and stand up for truth was admirable. We can learn a lot from him, and I hope you do. Calvary, I love you a lot. I hope you get an opportunity to crawl off that throne and stand up for gospel truth today. Have a great day.